Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Sentinel Innovation and Methods Seminar Series. My name is Judy Morrow. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute and Harvard Medical School. And today our Sentinel uh, Innovation and Methods Seminar Series um, is hosting Dr. Emily Pfaff. Um, she's gonna be presenting to us today on FIRE. Let me start out and tell you a little bit about the US Sentinel system in case folks are, are unaware. So this is FDA's system to monitor the safety and effectiveness of marketed medications. It includes both the Operations Center and the Innovation Center. The Operations Center, where I'm located, um, is directly tasked with bringing new evidence to support regulatory analyses using FDA's Active Risk Identification and Analysis, or ARIA, system. The Sentinel Innovation Center is tasked with focusing on developing innovative methods that advance Sentinel, leverage new data sources, and bring together um, new, new, new techniques with advanced analytics. We launched this webinar series to engage experts and innovators in very key areas related to both the Operations Center and Innovation Center's key interests. And with that, I'm pleased to announce today's speaker, Dr. Pfaff. Emily Pfaff is an assistant professor in UNC Chapel Hill's Department of Medicine, specializing in clinical informatics. Her research interests are clinical data modeling, data harmonization, and computable phenotyping. In addition to research and teaching, she co-directs the informatics component of UNC's CTSA, the NC Tracks Institute, and as of this year, is a multi-PI on the EHR component of the NIH's long COVID initiative, Recover. The title of her presentation today is Do All Roads Lead to Fire? Imagining Fire as a Meta Common Data Model for Research. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that all of your lines are muted. If you'd like to pose a question, please type it into the Zoom question and answer feature. We'll answer questions at the end of the session. Finally, this session is being recorded and the presentation will be made available through the Sentinel webpage, which can be found at sentinelinitiative.org. And without further ado, Emily, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'll turn it over to you to get started. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So let's get going. Okay. So the title of this talk is sort of an inside joke with myself um, because I gave a talk maybe three years ago, certainly pre-pandemic, um, called All Roads Lead to Fire. And I have since, you know, I keep questioning when that's going to happen, when we're all, all going to be sort of fireized and ready to go and, and launching fire as a meta common data model. I don't know that I can say that that's happened yet. So I am now questioning, do all roads lead to fire? And even though I think we are going to get there, um, I just, I think it's still open for debate. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So EHR data, as, as I think many of you probably know, is very similar, uh, and it doesn't really matter what site you're from, whether you're from a community hospital or an academic hospital, EHR data is about patients, those patients have visits, and things happen at those visits. Um, however, in terms of structure, in terms of vocabularies, they're just different enough to make very difficult to harmonize. And so while I think all EHR data is fruit, some of that fruit is apples, some of it's pears, some of it's bananas. And even when it's the same EHR vendor, so you can see I have as an example here, UNC's implementation of EPIC, and Duke's implementation of EPIC, we're 20 minutes down the road from each other, we care for many of the same patients, but if you looked within our respective EPIC databases, despite the structure being the same, I guarantee you that the data is still challenging to harmonize. And this is the environment that we find ourselves in. And much of that is not changeable. Um, and because of that, we rely on post-processing and we rely on innovative technologies to get to a place where we can harmonize data, um, in my case, and I'm sure in many of your cases for research purposes. So here's just an example of this difficulty of harmonization. Um, in this example here, both of these patients have COVID, but in hospital A, uh, this patient has a patient ID, and they have a diagnosis ID, and this is a SNOMED code. So this is a SNOMED code for COVID-19, totally valid and standard vocabulary, um, and they have a diagnosis date here. This patient also has a patient ID. You can see the column name is different. They have a diagnosis code, again, different column name, and here we have an ICD-10 code, also a valid standard vocabulary for diagnosis. Um, and diagnosis date, different format, different column name. 
this is the same information. And basically I wanna capture both of these patients when I'm looking for patients with COVID, but a single query is simply not gonna be able to find them because of the differences that we have here. And this makes population level multi-site research really, really challenging. So enter the common data model. Um, common data models are found commonly at academic health centers. They're found far less commonly at non-academic health centers. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm gonna be touching on a bit later. Um, but these are data models that are designed to allow us to structure healthcare data in the same way among partners that are using the same CBM. And many of you will be familiar with these four common data models. There are others, but I think that these are probably fairly characterized as the most common. There's Odyssey, also known as OMOP. I will probably say both in this presentation. Um, there's ACT, CTSA ACT. There is Trinetics and there is Cornet. And these four common data models have made really amazing advances in multi-site research by imposing some of that standardization and curation that I was referencing earlier on EHR data for those sites that choose to participate. And I do think that in addition to all of the wonderful standardization features that the CDMs have, that curation piece is also really important in that no matter how standardized your data is, raw data out of the EHR, as many of you know, can be a real mess. And while I don't think that any of us would say that the data that most of us have, uh, if you have a common data model, is perfect and pristine and um, completely ready for research use right out of the gate, I think that it does give us some opportunities to clean up a bit of the mess and make data more research ready. So that is yet another advantage of common data models. Um, CDMs are used mostly for research, um, although I, I certainly have heard of use cases of people using them for more operational QI purposes, so that's certainly allowable. Um, and most of the time, they are not real time. They are refreshed perhaps weekly, perhaps monthly, perhaps quarterly. So that really differentiates them from, for example, the databases that sit directly behind the EHR. Um, and those databases are more likely to be used for patient operations, that kind of thing. Now, one of the biggest challenges with CDMs is that many of us, uh, UNC included, have multiple of these. So at UNC, we have an ACT implementation, we have a PCORNET implementation, and we're building an OMOP implementation right now. And standing up three of these is not necessarily an inexpensive venture, and it's certainly high effort as well. The reason that we need three, and we can't just settle on one, is because in most use cases, the CDMs are not interoperable with each other. In fact, they look nothing like each other if you look at the data models. Um, and because of that, if you wanna participate in a study with somebody who has OMOP and you don't have OMOP, that means somebody's gotta make a change. Um, and hence why UNC has three CDMs. Um, now, there are exceptions that can make the CDNs interoperable with, the, with each other, and I am gonna talk about an example of that, but I'm also gonna talk about the fact that that may not always be the best option, and maybe, just maybe, FIRE can fill that gap. So, as I mentioned, the CDNs can be harmonized. It is not an impossibility, but it does take massive effort. So the example that I'm going to use here is the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or N3C, um, which some of you may be familiar with. For those of you who are not, it's an NCATS-funded initiative that started at the beginning of the pandemic to bring together as much data as possible about COVID-positive patients uh, in a centralized repository housed at NIH. We currently have 70 sites uh, that contribute data to N3C. And we wanted to make it as easy as possible for sites to contribute, especially with the stress of the pandemic. We didn't want to add yet another burden. And so we said, if you have one of these four data models, we're happy to accept data in any of those formats. Just send us what you have and we will deal with the harmonization on our end. I think we sort of knew what we were getting into, but it wasn't until we got started that I think I had a recognition of how much person power was required to do that harmonization. And I'm talking thousands of hours of person power, of people spending all day mapping value sets to each other, verifying mappings, running unit tests, all that stuff, um, before we felt like we had a 
decent harmonization between the four data models. And even today, even though everyone who works on UNC or UNC and 3C uh, has a lot to be proud of in terms of the work that's been accomplished and N3C is an absolutely excellent resource. I still don't know that I could say that all of these four data models are truly harmonized. And what I mean by that is you can go in the N3C data and you can still see the differences between the source data models even when harmonized. So just as a quick example, if the ACT data model, um, it, it does now, but at the time it didn't really support vitals, vital sign data. And so once we got to Odyssey, even though the ACT data had been harmonized, it was missing all vital data. And so it was clear which sites came from the ACT data model. PCORnet doesn't require a death date to record a patient as deceased. So by the time we got to Odyssey, all of the patients that had null death dates but were clearly deceased, we could tell that came from PCORnet. So I think it's wonderful that we were able to harmonize this, but it's not always going to be the answer for every research study, and we may need some alternatives. So enter HL7 FIRE. Um, FHIR is a standard healthcare data exchange format, um, and it's been around a while. So release one was published in 2014, and we are now currently on release four. Um, now CMS, Center for Medicaid, Medicare Medicaid Services, is taking steps to require the use of FHIR by both healthcare systems and payers to exchange data. Um, and so we know for a fact that FHIR is going to be part of our lives, kind of whether we want it or not. I think we do want it. Um, but it's, it's certainly not at the level yet where I feel like everyone is totally comfortable using FHIR and every healthcare system is up and running and shooting off FHIR messages left and right. I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, but I think we will get there. Because of these requirements, FHIR capabilities are baked into modern EHR software. And that's even true today. Even if your site doesn't have your FHIR endpoints all turned on, they are there and they are ready to be turned on when your institution is. But here's my little op-ed, um, and this is really a matter of opinion, but I think, I, I hope that many of you will sort of relate to this. And when we get to q and I'm interested to hear from folks about this. But I think talking about FHIR is hard. Um, you know, app companies love FHIR because for an app company who's doing marketing, the word FHIR sort of equates to innovative. And so you can say if you're using FHIR that you are, you know, on the bleeding edge of technology, and that's a really good marketing uh, uh, ploy there. Software developers love FHIR because it makes sense to them. Um, software developers really have an intimate understanding of how to use APIs to get data from one place to another. It's a nice standard. Um, it's understandable. So that's a group that's really into FHIR. And then interoperability advocates love FHIR because there is this promise that finally we are going to have truly interoperable technology with our EHRs. But for many of us, myself included, I consider myself a very technical person. But the concept of FHIR, depending on who is talking about it, can be a little bit hard to grasp. Um, I think it's very much like when somebody tries to explain the blockchain to you. And one, it depends on who's giving you the explanation, but it also depends on how they're characterizing FHIR. I think some people have a tendency to characterize FHIR as the thing that's going to cure all of our interoperability problems. And I think a more realistic standpoint is that FHIR is a really elegant data specification that we can work to make work for us. And, and that's really where I'm going to spend the, the most of uh, the rest of my time here. Um, just as a, an example of why FHIR can be a little intimidating is the way that it is encoded. So here on the bottom here, you have a really familiar kind of data structure, tabular data, you've got stuff stored in columns, you can sort of understand what's going on here, you've got a birth date, you've got a gender. Um, this same data is encoded here in JSON formatted FHIR. So you got the same ID, you've got the same race code, same gender, same birth date, but because it's in this serialized format that is less familiar to many of us, there's something sort of mysterious about this format that doesn't exist here. So I, I do think that that's part of the barrier to entry when we talk about FHIR is just the fact that it's pretty different from what we're used to. 
Now, the way that I explain kind of what FIRE is used for outside of the research world is by illustrating just the data exchange scenario. So in this scenario, Hospital A over here just admitted patient Erica Smith, but Erica usually gets her care at Hospital B. Um, now, Hospital A can electronically request Erica's records from Hospital B, and Hospital B can send over Erica's records in FIRE format. The advantage to that is that if Hospital B sends it in FIRE, there's a guarantee that Hospital A can understand and interpret what B is sending. And the analogy I like to make is that it's almost like Hospital B is walking over to Hospital A with a manila folder with Erica's records, because everything about Erica, whether it's her demographics, her diagnoses, her procedure history, it's all contained in FIRE files that are bundled together. And that's actually the term that FIRE uses is a bundle. But here's sort of where things get a little bit more complicated. If hospital A isn't talking about one patient, but is actually asking for records on all patients with COVID-19, then instead of walking over with a manila file folder, we're actually walking over with file cabinets full of patients. And this concept here of sending a lot of fire data for many, many, many patients is what's known as bulk fire. Now the bulk fire specification is, and it's probably not quite fair to say that it's not here yet because the specification does exist. Um, and I would say that maybe it's more fair to say that it is not widely used yet. Um, but bulk fire is the specification that will allow this send to happen with multiple patients and lots of fire data about them. Um, bulk fire is what's needed to do most research and population health work because we very rarely are interested in one or two or five patients at a time and are much more likely to be interested in 500 or 5,000 or 500,000 patients at a time. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, you know, your EHR at your institution probably has a bulk fire endpoint. It may not be turned on. Um, and so that's sort of why I say it is on its way, but not quite here yet. Um, I do recommend uh, this paper from 2020 that has a really nice overview of the current state of bulk fire, although 2020 is kind of ancient history at this point, so there very well could be updates that, uh, that I am not aware of. Um, but regardless, I think we do need to do something in the meantime to be able to leverage sort of the elegance of fire before everybody's ready to use this bulk fire spec. So let's talk about how FIRE can be used for multi-site research. And I'm gonna go through a couple of scenarios, uh, some of which I think are appropriate for FIRE and some of which are not. In this situation, this is a pretty common one when we're doing multi-site research. We got all academic health centers, all of them have the same data model, in this case, Odyssey. And the data coordinating center is fabulously happy that everybody has the same data model and agrees to use the same one. There is no need to use FIRE here. This is kind of your ideal scenario. The next scenario is more similar to the N3C example I gave earlier, where everybody's in academic health centers, you have a mix of common data models, the data coordinating center chooses to harmonize to one of those. And then the, the DCC has a choice, right? They can say, kind of like N3C did, we're gonna harmonize centrally, so don't worry about it sites. Or they can say to individual sites, we're gonna harmonize to, to OMOP or Odyssey, it's your responsibility to get your data in that format before you can participate in this study. They're both viable options. You may argue, um, but I don't know that FIRE is entirely necessary in this scenario either, so long as someone is willing to do the transformation. But then there's this scenario, and this is the one that, that at UNC we really were thinking a lot about. Um, I have a desire, and I know many of you do too, to be more inclusive of non-academic health centers in informatics research. And in order to do that, we need to accept that CDMs pretty much don't exist for the most part at non-academic medical centers. So if you're doing a study like this, where you have, let's say three academic health centers and one non-academic, you see that these three folks have CDMs, but this one just has Epic as an EHR. Could be Cerner, could be uh, Allscripts, any of those EHRs, but no CDM. In this case, the data coordinating center has a decision to make. And this is the scenario where I think FIRE really makes a lot of sense. Now, that doesn't mean that these uh, academics can't use that wonderfully curated, cleaned up data um, that they already have in their CDMs to produce FIRE 
So what I'm not suggesting is that these folks go all the way back to their raw EHR and produce fire from that. You see that this hospital is doing that because they don't have a choice. But if it were up to me and I'm this site over here, I wanna use my PCORnet data. I just wanna put it in fire format so that it can be mixed with this site's EPIC data. And that's what we built software to accommodate at UNC. So we have a software, a piece of software called Campfire, and I'll describe Campfire in more detail uh, as I talk here. But that is the function of Campfire, is to take data that is in a CDM, transform it to fire files, and then enable those fire files, which are totally compliant, uh, valid R4 fire, to be mixed with fire that was produced from other sources. So here's how the data flow in Campfire works. Um, in, we expect that you have common data model tables uh, locally, uh, as all of us do. And there are two main components to fireizing that common data model uh, data. The first thing is that we have developed what are called views and databases, which look just like database tables, which are essentially the fire specification in relational or tabular format. So I talked about earlier how it can be kind of intimidating to see the serialized JSON formatted fire because it's just not super familiar. We've actually taken that out of the equation temporarily and turned the serialized fire specification back into tabular data format. Um, we then transform the CDM data into that tabular format so that you essentially have a relational version of fire. But there is a second step, which is that the vocabularies that uh, FHIR uses and are valid for each of its data elements. So let's say uh, for gender, you know, you have F for female, M for male, U for unknown, O for other. It's scenarios like that. All of those mappings also have to be done. And so in addition to these view definitions, we also have a massive table of vocabulary mappings so that whatever your source data looks like in your CDM, by the time it comes out the other end, those values have been transformed to fire compliant vocabularies. Um, coming out the other end are your CDM tables, but in this fireized format. We then have a Java app, a campfire Java app, which uh, leverages the Happy Fire API, um, which is a wonderful resource that I encourage anyone who's interested in this to check out. And that application can read those fireized tables and then write out the, those full JSON formatted files that can then be shipped off to a data coordinating center, shipped off to a collaborator and mixed with other fire formatted data. So I, I do wanna dive a little bit deeper into mappings. Um, I talked about it before in terms of N3C with thousands of person hours. Um, it's really not too different in Campfire, although perhaps it's slightly less intimidating because we're out trying to combine four different data models into one. But, um, you know, the problem with any data transformation isn't transforming the data, it's transforming it correctly. Um, and in order to do that, you need to have an extremely well formatted and thoughtfully completed mapping file. Um, there's two different kinds of mappings. There are variable or field mappings that say that, for example, patient num in my original database needs to be transformed into a field called patient ID in the next database. So those are kind of simple, right? You kind of have a good idea generally, as long as the documentation is good, of what variable in database A needs to be transformed into which variable in database B. Where things get more tedious is in terms of value set mappings. I gave a gender example earlier. Race example, FHIR has a ton of race variables, a ton of language variables. There are things like specimen source for labs that have literally hundreds of options. All of those individual value sets need to be considered and mapped to the source data in order to have a high fidelity transformation where you're not losing information uh, on the way from your source format to FHIR. Um, you may find some instances where you do lose a little bit of information, but we want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, so our example here is that we take uh, your source data here, and in this case, this is the I2B2 data format. We map that to our variables in our, um, in our views that are relational fire. And then we also map, uh, for example, race code one in the source database to the fire version of that race, which is a LOIC code. 
And then finally, we write out the results as uh, JSON. Um, now, just as a, just an example of what those mappings look like. And so the value set mappings, there's nothing magic about them. It's just a really long table. Um, and having it like this, as opposed to buried in the source code, enables users to validate and change mappings, which is nice. And one of the reasons that I wanted to touch on this specifically is something that I'm gonna to touch on a bit more later, and it's sustainability. Um, whenever we are mapping one data model to another, to another, to another, we have to keep in mind that that task is never done. We can do it and we can call it version 1.0, but as soon as one of those data models updates, has a new version, decides to change the structure of a table, we need to keep up with that or our mappings are gonna get stale. What I have found, and I'm assuming this is a universal experience, is that it is very disappointing when you get really excited about using a piece of open source software and you find that it is no longer being updated, it's no longer being maintained, and it's no longer uh, that high fidelity experience that you were ex expecting. And I think in our field in general, we, um, what I look forward to is working with, you know, my colleagues to figure out sustainable sources of this mapping information, because this problem of needing to transform from one data model to another is never going to go away. Fire is not going to solve that problem. It's just going to be another data uh, source to map to. So interesting food for thought there. Now, to use Campfire, we actually have a, a nice graphical user interface where you can enter the database that you are um, uh, sourcing your data from. And you can define an output folder. You can define how many records you want per file. That's very important because when you get into JSON formatted fire files, they can get very, very large. They're very verbose. And if you try to stuff 500,000 patients in a single text file, it's going to be very difficult for you to work with. Um, and we also enable people to select what fire resource they're going for. Um, in the case of working with CDMs, it's actually a pretty limited set of, of fire resources that are supported, things that are obvious like patients, visits, uh, diagnoses, that kind of thing. Um, in the future, we may see CDMs supporting more of, of the hundred and some fire resources that are out there, but really we're talking about a dozen or fewer resources that are really impacted by the CDMs. And you can see here when we run Campfire, you end up with a bunch of different files, depending on how many records you want per person. And then when you crack open one of those files, in this case, this is a patient resource containing the SINPUF data, um, you will see that you have the equivalent for whatever source data you put in coming out the other end as JSON formatted fire. So what do you do with data once it's in fire? Well, I think that that's another unanswered question. And that has to do with some of the comfort level stuff I talked about earlier, where I think some of us are, including myself, really excited to work with fire, but it's kind of like, you know, the dog that caught the car, right? Once you have the data in fire, what, what exactly do we do next? You could leave it in fire. Um, you can convert it back to relational data, which I admit is probably my bias um, because I like to work with data relationally. So in my case, and again, this is very much a matter of opinion, I like the idea of using FHIR as a data exchange format and not a data persistence format. I don't love the idea of storing reams and reams and reams of FHIR files because again, they're very large and I'd rather do my analysis relationally. That's just me. There are plenty of use cases that I'm sure people have that, that would want to keep the FHIR data in FHIR format, perhaps stored in something like a Hadoop database that allows people to actually work with the data and analyze it while it's in that JSON format, um, non-relational. Um, also, I think on the future roadmap, one could convert the data back to a common data model. So that's sort of the holy grail, right, is that I mentioned earlier that it's so labor intensive to set up one of these things from scratch. And we're now building a, a OMOP Odyssey at UNC and we're finding out just how much work it is. I think it's work that's well worth it. But if there was a way in the next couple of years to actually be able to produce an OMOP, fully fledged OMOP database from FHIR files, I can imagine how much more accessible that would make data models like OMOP, like Picornet, to lots more uh, research centers that have maybe smaller informatics teams, less informatics resources, et cetera. Um, I think the real takeaway is that the chosen path that you take from FHIR really depends very much on your use case. <laughs>
So, you know, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, you know, the campfire mappings are done by human and humans make mistakes. And we do build in as many possible peer review and check processes as we can. And I think that we've done an excellent job. And I think the folks at N3C that did mappings for that project have done an excellent job. But there's always a chance for error. And I think that we need to accept that knowing that every time you transform data from one model to another, you may just have this small chance of loss of fidelity. We have to deal with that as a field. We have to figure out mechanisms that will make us confident uh, in, in the work that we are you know, putting so much pressure on essentially to get accurate results at the other end. And as I mentioned earlier, those mappings are never done and they require maintenance and continued funding. It is not easy, never has been easy, to get funding to maintain stuff. All of the funding that's available generally is to build new stuff. And I think if we have that model and that's the only model available, we're gonna end up with a lot of amazing open source products that just fade away after their, their initial funding stream is gone. Um, and I think that that's a, a danger when we're talking about things like mappings, which technically are projects that all of us can get together on and sort of crowdsource, if there's a will and, and if there is support for dedicated time and effort to do that. Um, and then, you know, a, another sort of CDM specific challenge is that if you're doing a study that has a desired data element that's not in the CDM, it is a lot less straightforward to use a product like Campfire um, because there just isn't a good uh, a source for the data. And so that is a, a, another caveat to consider there. Now, for fire in general, um, you know, as I mentioned, the fire sizes, the file sizes rather, can be large. Um, what we have found is that working with Campfire on a cohort is much more manageable than trying to transform everyone in the EHR to fire. I think that um, that's really where I think the sweet spot for a product like Campfire is, is that if you have 5,000 patients and you need their longitudinal data for a few years, that is entirely manageable, even if the, the sizes get rather large. We're talking about 500,000, still doable, but maybe less desirable. Um, and that, that EHR health organization support for FHIR is just, it's not quite where it needs to be for FHIR to truly be a lingua franca for, for us that we can start using, you know, like gangbusters for research uses. I do want to uh, sort of not to not to be in a soapbox about this, but I do think that there is a workforce development conversation that can happen around this, where the relational database model has been around since 1969. That explains why a lot of us are really, really comfortable with that model. Frankly, it hasn't changed a whole lot since 1969. And so the clinical informatics workforce that we all know and love, and I'm including myself in this, is really highly skilled in using relational data. And I think that getting used to working with data that is non-relational is gonna require a whole new set of skills, training and time. The people who are currently working in the informatics workforce are, have so much institutional knowledge, they have so much deep understanding of electronic health data, um, we don't want to lose that, uh, that, that depth of knowledge simply because we're changing data formats. Rather, I think that we need to get together as consortia, as colleagues, and figure out how we can train up the workforce and train up ourselves on understanding the best ways to work with FHIR specifically. Um, if sites aren't comfortable with the technology, they're not going to want to use it, and, and that's just the truth of the matter. Um, now, I do know that many of the um, NIH RFAs that have come out recently, especially around the informatics space, have specifically asked sites to work with FHIR, to produce data in FHIR, to exchange data in FHIR. That is something that is clearly a priority for NIH right now, as well as other organizations. And so it's not a matter of maybe we should get comfortable with it so that we can use it. It's a matter of we need to get comfortable with it so that we can use it. So this whole workforce development angle is a really huge interest of mine. Um, you know, just, just uh, one more aspect of Campfire here is that uh, we have a current version release. It is open source software. Anyone is welcome to get it. It is completely free of charge. In some ways, it's like a free puppy because you have to implement it and sort of give it care and feeding. 
But we do support Picor Nut from front to back right now, which is great. Um, and so if you are a Picor Nut site and you want to use Campfire to transform your Picor Nut data into Fire, um, you can use Campfire to do that today. We do support ACT uh, as well uh, currently, but we don't support the newest ontology. And so if there is a demand for that, folks are interested in us continuing that development, would very much like to hear from you because we can, we can make that happen. Right now we go from CDM to FHIR. We do not go from FHIR to CDM. That's certainly on the roadmap, but not at the moment. And I just have a link on the slide to go get it. Um, and then in the future, we're going to be supporting even more variables than we do today, and we plan to add support for OMOP. Um, I think the support for OMOP is especially timely because I know that OMOP and HL7 have announced a much closer working relationship. I am really intrigued to see how that works out and what different tools uh, and, and, and methods that collaboration results in. And if there is a need for Campfire to fill in any gaps, we will be there to meet that. And if we can leverage work that that collaboration produces on its own, we will be there to do that too. So I'm keeping a very, very close eye on that. So the takeaways about FHIR. Um, FHIR is not ubiquitous yet, as we've uh, discussed. I do think it's getting there. And I think that it would not be a good decision to wait until it's on the cusp of being ubiquitous before we really get to understanding it as an informatics community. Um, but I think probably the most appealing thing about it, at least for me, is this idea that leveraging FHIR for research may enable a broader set of institutions to participate in informatics-driven research. I think that the more we take uh, EHR data-driven research out of solely academic healthcare systems talking to each other and bring in more community hospitals, rural hospitals, et cetera, as much as we can, we are gonna be able to do better and more inclusive research. Um, and, and that just needs to be a huge priority for our community. Um, but the nice thing is, is that let's say, you know, in the future that those institutions are able to use just their native EHR to produce fire, uh, great. We wanna enable, uh, the academics that have other options to uh, leverage their existing infrastructure, which may mean CDMs, to create fire data on the fly. Um, and so I think that's gonna sort of be our best of both worlds um, uh, outcome and one I hope to see in the next couple of years. So that is what I have to cover today. I really look forward to hearing any questions and uh, thank you so much for having me. Emily, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we're gonna wait a minute for a couple of the questions to start to gather in the Q&A, but I'll, uh, I'll take the moderator's privilege of asking a first one. Um, can I ask you to talk a little bit about when you're talking about using FHIR from particularly the community-based health centers that don't have a CDM, where likely I would assume the FHIR transfer is gonna include private health information. Whereas, for example, in the CDMs, a lot of that has been removed for patient privacy and, and sort of research purposes. How do you envision that being another step to think about where there's de-identification that might be necessary or other steps to preserve patient privacy if you have something coming straight out of an EHR? No, that, that's a really good uh, question. And I think that there are some advantages in the relational world for that, in that it's very, very easy to scramble the data. You're absolutely right. Um, now, the FHIR APIs that are available do allow us to say, you know what, don't send the social security number field. Um, so just because we get data raw out of the EHR doesn't mean that it's an all or nothing kind of arrangement. But let's say that we do need dates of service uh, as part of the research study that we're doing, which is obviously very common and very important. Um, in that case, if it were just a regular relational situation, we would have an algorithm that goes through and uh, shifts the dates for a given patient by some consistent interval. I think that um, you're absolutely right that we will need to have that method available, uh, at least on the receiving end, to deal with that, those dates in FHIR format, um, so that at least when the data coordinating center, in my example, receives the data, they can receive the data as shifted dates, even if it wasn't sent that way. 
Yeah, I think it's a really, uh, it's a ripe area for, for thinking about how to, how to combine. Um, a couple of some clarification questions that are coming from the audience. Um, I can tell you from looking at the attendees here, a lot of folks are not familiar with FIRE, so you might get a lot of clarifications. So um, one as first is, is FIRE complementary to HL7 or is it a replacement? Are there features in FIRE that are lacking in HL7? And actually, I, I think I, I'm a little familiar, but I think it'd be nice if you, you talked very briefly about FIRE resources, if you could spend a few minutes just talking about what that means for folks who are less familiar with FIRE. Absolutely. So I'm actually, if you give me just a moment, I'm going to pull up a web page so that I can share again, because I think that's going to be the best way to show this. So Apologies if you hear my dog barking. Um, so this is the main fire specification website, uh, which is a very useful uh, place to go to get lots of information about fire. But a fire resource is simply a bundle of information about a given uh, unit of analysis. Now that sounded more complicated than I perhaps intended it to, but in this case, this is the patient resource. If I dive in here, what I can see is that HL7 has defined a bunch of variables that they think are important about patients and belong to a patient. There are things here that you would not uh, find terribly confusing, right? Things like name, gender, birth date, address, et cetera. Um, these are all things about patients. And so if I ask for data exchange about patients um, and a, uh, the receiving institution says, sure, I'll send you the patient file back. What I will get is as many of these variables as are populated in the EHR filled out in that, that, that uh, JSON format that I was showing. But we don't just have patients, we also have things like uh, practitioner, which is gonna be the same kinds of information about providers. We have things like uh, uh, procedures and conditions, which of course are very common. Um, all kinds of medication information, whether it is the actual prescription and inpatient administration, or a dispense at a pharmacy. Um, so very, very specific and granular resources to cover each kind of healthcare event that HL7 covers. And so what we are saying when we are creating fire resources from CDM data is that we are taking, for example, the contents of the patient table uh, in, in the Cornet CDM and stuffing it into this format instead so that that format is understandable. Um, uh, by, by sort of a, a fire translator. Um, in terms of um, the, the first part of that question, can you remind me again? Well, there was a question about um, the differences between fire and HL7. So whether fire is re fully replacing HL7 or is a supplement to HL7. So it's relational um, about that. And then I think what you were just doing is sort of making the connections between units of analysis where people, I think for the CDMs particularly are thinking of tables Fire's language that you, you've already spoken a little bit about it is resources and bundles. Right. And so it's just yep. getting familiar with the lingo. Exactly. And I, I think that kind of speaks to, to my earlier point too about how getting familiar with this new paradigm of structuring data is probably most of the battle to actually getting fire used because the more comfortable we are with it, the less scary it will be. Um, now, in terms of whether it's going to be a replacement for HL7, I have to admit that I don't know the answer to that. At the moment, I would call it a supplement. Um, currently, hospitals are still using HL7 version two. There is an HL7 version three, um, but it is, it's less used than version two, at least last time I checked. Um, and it, that is used globally, HL7 version two. So if fire is gonna be a replacement, certainly not gonna happen tomorrow. Sounds good. We have another question from the audience about explaining or expanding a little bit more on what you've said about the difference between a relational database and a non-relational database, and particularly what flavor is FHIR? Is FHIR a relational database or is FHIR a non-relational database? Yep, yep. So FHIR itself is not a database. FHIR is a data design. It is a specification. So all FHIR says is if you make your data look like this, we'll call it compliant FHIR. Um, in order to make FHIR a database, that means that you have to set up a database in order to store FHIR data. 
Um, if you are using a relational database, again, the kind of tabular data that we're really familiar with, you will have, we'll just use the, the example again of a patient table. You're gonna have a patient table and each row in that table is gonna be a patient and all of the columns across are gonna be information about that patient. If you take the patient table in its entirety, um, it is going to uh, contain information about every patient that you're interested in. So everything's bundled together in one package. A fire message or fire file, I really do think of as more like a paper chart for a patient in that if you open that manila folder for Erica Smith, you're gonna find maybe a face sheet that has some basic information about her, Maybe you'll find a couple of imaging orders that you're paging through and you'll have the report for the image and, and impression and narrative and findings. Maybe you'll have some after visit summaries and just a big stack of paper, but that whole stack of paper is about Erica. It's not about every patient that you have. And because of that, what FIRE is really good for is providing very complete information about one person or a few people. In a relational database, if I wanna get that same kind of coverage, I need to go to the patient table and join that to the visit table and join that to the procedure table and the condition table. Uh, whereas in FHIR, it's all kind of bundled together. But that kind of works against us when we want to look at data for a lot of patients, um, because instead of that sort of easy ability to join across tables, the way that a relational database works, FHIR doesn't really offer that. And so that's where our, a couple of options come in, where we can either translate fire data back to the relational format, which is completely an option, or fire data can be stored in a non-relational database, which is a database that you can query and use, but it's not in that tabular format. In the case of fire, you would store the data right in that native JSON format where you have like the word patient colon and then somebody's name, right? you could go find Erica Smith's fire files in that, uh, that non-relational database. It just works differently than a relational database. In some ways it's not as, not as efficient and in some ways it's more efficient. It really depends on your use case. Thanks, Emily. So I wanna ask you about something that um, at the FDA, there's a lot of work that's done on uh, people longitudinally. So the need to follow somebody over a course of two or three or four years. Now, because we live in the United States and you can go into one medical center and then the next day you can go into another medical center. And as you pointed out, even in your example, medical center A and B, they can talk to each other, but they might not. Um, so when you're thinking about creating uh, something like Campfire to, to combine data for research purposes, what do you think about needing to deduplicate or to somehow be, essentially the bottom line is to reconcile, if you would, fire files. So I might get a fire file from, you know, site A, and I might get a fire file from site B, and they, you know, well, one, it's, do I know if they're the same person? But then two, if there are the same person and they have conflicting information, for example, different race variables or something like that, how do I go about thinking about reconciliation? Yeah, that, that is such an important area right now, especially as data linkage and especially linkage with things like claims data, um, where you might have the same people, but referenced by completely different identifiers. Um, that is just becoming so important right now. I don't know that FHIR helps us solve that problem, but I don't think it hurts either. So I think ongoing deduplication efforts, there's, um, you know, there's a, certainly a couple of ways of solving that problem, probably many ways. In one uh, respect, you, if you are working with a partner where you can easily share the identifiers with each other, then you have a lot of options in terms of uh, probabilistic matching algorithms to find Emily Path in database A and Emily Path in database B are actually the same person, even though I, you know, my last name is spelled wrong in database B. Um, so probabilistic matching can be very uh, powerful that way. And once the matches are identified through that manner, uh, once you get fire files in that have the original identifiers, they can pretty easily be swapped out to the ones that are needing to be deduped. Now, what we find more often, and this may be the case um, for those on this call as well, is a reticence, understandably, to share those identifiers. So what we have engaged in more recently is a lot of efforts uh, in privacy-preserving record linkage, where we turn each patient's identifiers into a hash or other sort of digital fingerprint uh, 
that then we can compare to that same digital fingerprint on the, uh, from the database on the other side of the equation and determine through that mechanism who is the same in both databases. Again, I don't think FHIR either helps or hinders that method, but I do think that um, when we do those efforts to do that deduplication, it is uh, certainly feasible to, um, to pass those deduped patients over to FHIR files to, to dedupe them there as well. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, hopefully uh, it's gonna be working for you guys as you start to get more into privacy preserving record linkage. Um, so a question in the chat is about um, the unique nature of the US healthcare system, which makes the need for harmonization you know, really strong. Do you have any thoughts or experience with other international entities and how they might be going about some of these same problems or solving these same problems? So I wish I had more global EHR data experience. I am terribly US-based, um, but I completely agree with the premise that we do make things much harder for ourselves in the US than we need to. There's no question about that. Um, one of the ways that really doesn't have anything to do with fire is just how inconsistent we are in terms of the vocabularies that we use to describe things. So for example, uh, we can, very validly code procedures using the CPT vocabulary, or we can use the ICD-10 procedure vocabulary. Those things don't talk to each other all that easily. It's doable, you can translate, but wouldn't it be easier if they were just the same to begin with? Um, same thing with ICD-10 diagnoses and SNOMED. Most international uh, EHRs, as far as my understanding goes, please correct me, anyone, if, if you know better than I do, uh, use SNOMED as a standard for diagnosis data. Um, in their EHRs. And though SNOMED is in some places in the US EHRs, it is far less common than ICD-10. So you end up with these situations where people have followed all the rules in the US to standardize their data, and it's still not standardized. It makes it very difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, with respect to that, can you talk about maybe some of the stories that are some of the lessons learned that you've had um, with respect to um, some of that mapping process, because you spent obviously a lot of time um, going through and trying to make sure that, and that's really an important point, I think, in all of uh, the FDA's work, especially as they, they venture into real world data and real world evidence, is understanding what something means, you know, what, you know that, that they're talking about the same thing, even if it has different names, it's ultimately that it's the same thing and real concerns about heterogeneity. Can you talk about some of the things that you've learned in your experience? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to channel the campfire development team and the N3C mapping team, again, who deserve all the credit in the world for going through this very tedious effort. Um, but from them, I have heard uh, uh, some, some interesting lessons learned that I think we can certainly take forward. One is that there are a lot of square peg round hole situations when you're mapping from one data model to another. Um, sometimes it just isn't the best fit and you have a piece of data on one side that you're trying to find a standard code for on the other side and it's just not happening. In fact, just as it happened probably last week, we had an example where we were having a very hard time finding a standard way to describe an observation stay, in, which is not quite an inpatient visit and not quite an emergency visit. It's this concept called observation stay, where maybe you're holding a patient overnight just to observe them, make sure they're okay before you send them home. Um, standard vocabularies don't describe visits very well. And so we were desperately looking to find some standard way to describe that concept. And there just isn't a great concept that fits our needs. When we reach that, pro that, that point in, in a mapping effort, we have to make the decision do we try to find the closest possible match or do we map it to something like other? Now, there's disadvantages to both. If you, if you try a sort of almost there but not quite match, you have to understand the implications of that are that people are gonna trust the mappings that you make and those mappings will have downstream implications on any research that gets done on that data going forward. Um, so, you know, very much a with great power comes great responsibility situation. On the other hand, if you say, you know what, not comfortable with that, I'm gonna map it to other, other is basically useless when it comes to doing any kind of research about anything. And you have essentially lost that piece of information. It's almost as bad as it just being missing altogether. 
And so each one of these decisions can result in long discussions of advantages and disadvantages. And we're talking just one variable at a time. Um, so that's been a really, really interesting process. And the other piece is just finding the best ways to peer review mappings to make sure that there are more than one set of eyes on any pair of mappings, um, especially because a lot of mapping work is based on sort of opinion, you know, educated opinion and, and opinion from folks who are working in this field, but still somebody's got to make a call and making sure that we have uh, almost like a multi-reviewer agreement on, on what gets mapped to what is really important for people to feel like our mappings are credible and usable for their study. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, and something also that it seems to me if, you're, if your point is, is that this is more of a cohort-based phenomena than a database phenomena, at least they're really the people who are making the decision about the cohort you know, can make their own decisions based on their research question. Um, can I ask you, Emily, if there's, any fire gaps in terms of data that you see where you think that, for example, there isn't a, a fire, you know, bundle or resource that's, you know, sort of available, but would be really useful or if there's any place where you think that that needs to be um, grown or uh, elaborated on. Well, the nice thing about fire is that it is very extensible. So FHIRE has a very sophisticated process by which new resources and new variables are added, lots of committees, lots of voting. I don't claim to know how it works, but I think they have a really uh, superb system set up. That said, they're not gonna cover everything that people need. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when we were first building Camp FHIRE, we actually had a need to put in a latitude and longitude for patient location, not just the street address. And at the time, although I haven't checked it to see if they've changed this recently, but at the time we were using release three, we're now in release four, and there simply was not a, a field available for that. And so um, what's nice is that FHIRE has very specific rules for how you can add custom things to FHIRE um, to accommodate your needs. And as long as you follow that rule, those rules, your FHIRE file will still be valid and compliant, which is great um, because I think with the other common data models, which are again, tabular based format, it's not really encouraged to add columns, change columns, et cetera. And there really aren't rules of the road for doing that. So you're sort of on your own if you wanna do that. Um, but FHIRE really gives you the flexibility to do that. Now, what the disadvantage of that is, is that if I make a latitude and longitude field and it's an extension that's custom at UNC, my friends at Duke or Harvard or whoever we're working with don't have that same extension. And so if I want that data to be truly harmonizable and standardized, I'm going to have to convince them to make the same change on their end. Um, so I think FHIRE has done probably the best that they can to be able to encourage customization, even though, you know, because of human nature, it's not going to be perfect. Yeah, um, it's good to know there's a way though, right? And so um, yep. there, there's a way to do it. It's better than having no solution at all. Exactly. So I think we're, we're at time, um, folks. So I would like to once again, thank Emily for presenting today's webinar. And I wanna remind everybody that this session has been recorded and it will be made available to the Sentinel webpage probably within a day or two. Um, you can also find details and registration for future Innovation Center and Methods uh, seminars on the website, sentinelinitiative.org. So this concludes our session. Thank you again, Emily. And um, we hope to see you next time. Goodbye, Thanks everybody. So much.